Next, we have with us an association which works with government and industry sectors to not only help define their contributions, but also help deploy engineered carbon capture solutions. CCSA, a trade association, also engages with technology providers like Endress Hauser, so we can add value in decarbonizing and ensure easy adoption of technology. We have with us Ruth Herbert, CEO of CCSA, and Neil Jackson, our industry expert from UK, to discuss how nationally determined contributions boil down to resource allocation and CCUS projects in the country. Thank you for that introduction, Yanish, and thank you, Ruth, uh, for talking to us today. We're seeing the impact of climate change almost on a daily basis, and we know the importance of keeping to a 1.5 degree C rise in temperatures. But just how important is it um, that we deploy carbon capture and storage capabilities at scale to enable this? I think it's really important because there are certain uh, parts of the economy that can only decarbonise using carbon capture, utilisation and storage. Uh, the IEA's report, uh, Energy Technologies Perspectives in 2020 on CCUS, uh, set out that there was roughly 8 billion tonnes, that's 8 gigatons of CO2 from power plants and industrial plants that would be emitted into the atmosphere unless they deploy CCUS. And that's by 2050. So, you know, that, that's a lot to capture in a relatively short space of time. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, the UK has committed to some ambitious uh, nationally determined contributions or NDCs. Um, but just what are they? And uh, are the levels of resources um, and funding that is being committed, is that enough? Yeah, so obviously a number of countries, uh, including the UK, have signed up to net zero by 2050. Uh, the UK's NDC submitted in December 2020 was 68% uh, reductions against 1990 levels by 2030. Mm. Um, but the UK subsequently in June last year, um, under the sixth carbon budget legislation, uh, set uh, a commitment to decarbonise by 78% uh, by 2035. So uh, that's uh, another target, another step on the way to 2050. Uh, and I think that's, that's really important. I think it's really hel helpful to start to understand what that trajectory looks like. And, and clearly that was in reaction to the Climate Change Committee's uh, advice. Uh, and their advice uh, was uh, across the economy on sort of uh, pathways to net zero by 2050. And that included uh, needing to uh, deploy CCUS to capture and store around 104 million tonnes of CO2 a year by 2050. Okay, so a clear, um, clear goals, clear ambition and a reasonable level of uh, resources to make that happen, but, but work to be done. Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to resources, just to be clear, I think the, the net zero strategy that the government published in November, just before COP26 in Glasgow, did uh, go into a lot more detail about how the 78% and the, the net zero by 2050 would be um, achieved. Uh, I think uh, that, I mean, that included uh, deploying uh, two CCUS clusters by the mid-20s and a further two clusters by 2030. Uh, there is a billion pounds allocated of capital for CCUS, and that was reconfirmed within the recent budget but they so far have not set out how they will fund what we call the business models, and that is effectively the payments to emitters to deploy the capture technology on an ongoing basis, uh, and that, that funding hasn't yet been identified. So great ambition, but not all the resources are in place yet, and we're waiting for an update on that this year. Okay, all right. Um, can you talk about the different um, approaches that there are to uh, energy and transition, um, as well as uh, carbon capture? Yes, so I think, uh, I mean, the good thing about carbon capture and, and storage is you, you can use it on a, a range of, of, of different applications. So in particular, um, 
it's, it's mainly, I think, going to be uh, deployed for the industrial sector uh, and, and really critical there. It's, it's the only way they can, uh, a lot of those industries can de decarbonise. But we're, the government has also set out an ambition to have uh, dispatchable gas-fired uh, power stations with CCUS, uh, and that is to provide uh, sort of uh, electricity when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, so mm. to complement renewables and enable us to scale renewables up more, we need some of this, this uh, flexible capacity that's low carbon. Uh, so that will be uh, post-combustion on a gas-fired power station. Um, there's also, obviously, pre-combustion technology, so uh, application, uh, so burning the hydrogen, so a hydrogen-fired power plant, mm -hmm. uh, capturing the CO2 before that, and hydrogen production, effectively, mm -hmm. uh, which can also then provide hydrogen to industry for them to use. So there are different models for how industry can decarbonise. It could use the blue hydrogen, uh, or, it could, or it could be captured directly from, from the industrial plant. Um, there's also uh, greenhouse gas removals. Mm -hmm. uh, the government has set a target for five uh, million tonnes to be captured using greenhouse gas removal technologies by 2030. Is that direct air capture? Yeah, so technology? that's direct air okay. capture and also bioenergy with CCS. Okay. Uh, and those are negative emissions technologies, uh, or we'll call greenhouse gas removals technologies because they're actually also removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So that's a way of dealing with historic CO2, uh, CO2 that's already been emitted, rather than uh, avoiding further CO2 emissions. So it's, it, that should be eligible for uh, double credits under the ETS, but we're yet to see that uh, change made in, in legislation. And that's a really key part of the business model for those. Article 6 of the Paris Agreement um, talks about the regulatory um, rigour and measures that emitters will need to go, th uh, go to. But when a company says it's captured and stored one million tonnes of CO2, how do we really know that that's the case? Yeah, so within uh, the EU and the UK, there's already a clear regulatory standard which has been in place for over 10 years. Uh, that is uh, derived from the EU Directive on the Geological Storage of CO2. And what that says is if the CO2 is stored in uh, line with the requirements of a CO2 storage permit, then it is uh, assumed not emitted under the EU ETS. And, and we have the same requirement in the UK under the, the now UK ETS. Okay. Um, and those uh, monitoring, uh, measurement and verification requirements are, are very high. Uh, and what they require is for uh, seismic or best uh, available techniques in, in monitoring of that storage plume once it is within the geological formation. Now in the UK we're focused on offshore storage, so we're talking about uh, either a depleted saline aquifer, uh, uh, sorry, either a saline aquifer or a depleted oil and gas field, mm -hmm. uh, about a thousand metres under the seabed, uh, and there is a lot of experience in our oil and gas industry and also in the OGA in understanding how to uh, assess these things and make sure that the CO2 stays there. Uh, and it's expected to stay there over geological timescales, so millions of years, um, but we can measure that. So, so that's all proven, uh, and that's based very much on the experience of the Sleipner field in Norway, which was a similar offshore, uh, it was a saline aquifer under the seabed off the coast of Norway, and there they've been monitoring the CO2 plume in that saline aquifer for over 20 years, and they can predict exactly uh, how it's going to migrate within that formation which is capped and it stays exactly within the bounds it's meant to. So, so that's all really tried and tested and there's a clear regulator in place and clear standards. Um, we've also got a regulatory regime under development for the onshore pipeline network and there it's really equally important I think that we know exactly what each uh, capture site, whether that's a power plant or industrial plant, what they have injected into the network that the purity of the carbon dioxide uh, is suitable for the pipelines, that uh, it's been injected at the pressure it should be injected at, 
and critically above all else that they are we are measuring exactly how much they are injecting and that they will not get ETS credits uh, for anything that they do not inject uh, and we can track then that all the way through to the storage site using using measurement techniques so that's really really important uh, and I think uh, we are working with Bayes, Ofgem, industry and others to make sure that the rules for that network, and it's called a network code, that they are developed and clear on all of these points, in particular the type of metering required. Obviously for um, this is to work on a global um, basis, um, you know, we've got, we have to have a great deal of collaboration. Um, how is the CCSA um, working with other global CCS uh, initiatives? Yes, yeah, so we have a Brussels office as well, and they are involved uh, in, in CCUS in Europe uh, through their running of the Secretariat of uh, two initiatives, the Industrial and the, the Power Plant Initiative uh, with CCUS in, in the EU. Uh, uh, and so we're very joined up with them, and obviously there's a lot of interaction around things like cross-border CO2, and rules for CO2 shipping and so on, because not all emissions within Europe are going to be close to subsea storage sites, so that's going to be really, really important. Um, we are also uh, involved uh, in disseminating the knowledge from UK and Europe uh, more widely through partners such as the International CCUS Knowledge Centre mm -hmm. and the IEA GHD programme, which has international membership. Uh, and there we uh, support them. For example, we jointly held an official UN C side event at COP26 in Glasgow. I also attended a number of other side events there, obviously trying to share what we've learned in the UK, particularly our work on business models, which is still fairly ahead of, of what most, most uh, countries are doing. Um, uh, and they, the International CCS Knowledge Centre develop champions in different countries for example they've recently set one up in Nigeria as a center of excellence and we are supporting them with any advice and help that we can and we do have a number of international members and they look at our website we get a lot of international traffic there mm. and we have case studies there that are accessible to the public also uh, every other month our webinars are open to externals and we get a lot of international interest in those as well as our annual conference. So definitely raising awareness, uh, confidence about CCUS globally is really, really key because uh, it's global emissions, eight, eight gigatons mm -hmm. that we've got to try to capture and store by 2050. Right. So there is a good level of uh, collaboration and momentum that is gaining there. It feels like that and it did feel like there was momentum at COP26. Uh, especially with the, the, the agreement to phase down fossil fuels. Uh, and people said it could have been stronger, but I think it sent a really strong signal to countries to start looking at how they do that, and that means they've got to look at putting CCUS in their NDCs. Okay. Well, thank you, Ruth, for that insight. And back to you, Janish. It's clear that collaboration between country leaders, industry sectors, energy companies, research associations, and also technology providers will pave the way forward. And they all play a critical role. Let's focus on our hard to abate industries. If we take a quick look at the global pipeline of commercial CCUS facilities in operation and in development, we'll find that we need to increase our capacity by 150 times in these industries to achieve net zero by 2050. 